Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. I probably shouldn't say this, but I think I blocked Roland Schumann out of my mind and have been trying to delete him from my nightmares ever since beating the Aussie men's four times 100 meter medley relay team in 2004, the Olympic Games in Athens. Despite that, it was indeed a pleasure to meet him recently. So born in Pretoria, South Africa, Roland first took an interest in swimming when I believe he was 13 and apparently was uh, just trying to impress a girl. So he began competitive swimming three years later, and this marked the beginning of a career that would see him attain a gold, silver and bronze medal at the 2004 Olympic Games, three gold, a silver and a bronze world championship medals, as well as four gold, three silver and three bronzes at the Commonwealth Games. After being voted the African Swimmer and South African Swimmer of the Year for multiple years running, Roland was then elected South African Sports Star of the Year in 2004. The list of his awards and records would take the rest of the podcast, so let's just leave it there and welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Awesome. As I said, it was an absolute pleasure to meet you and you're so inspiring and so that's why I had to get you on the podcast to tell inspiring athletes <laughs> or perhaps just general people just to give us an idea of what it's like being such a high level athlete and I'd love to delve into I guess all about fitness and health and your life and I guess I wanted to start with a bit of a common perception that I see today there seems to be a lot of I guess pressure on younger children to start early in their field to become a professional athlete It doesn't seem to be true with you in terms of when you started to become a professional athlete, or maybe I'm wrong. So when and why did you start getting into swimming and and what was your athletic background? I don't think my athletic background or my swimming career ever started with long-term athletic development in mind. I think that was just sort of a fortuitous direction that it ended up taking. I was blessed that I grew up in a country, South Africa, where it was sport and being involved with different sports was more sought after at that period of time than generally focusing on one specific thing I, I think being the era and and place that i grew up in it you know there wasn't a ton of money to be made in sports so it was okay well you know in summer i'll play cricket and tennis and do track and field and i'll swim and in the winter i'll play rugby and soccer and field hockey and whatever else was around and i enjoyed being out and about i enjoyed being a part of a team i think even more so than swimming the story of when I, I actually started swimming when I was six years old, I swam for about three months or I actually don't even remember if it was three months or three weeks. I had severe asthma and my mom and dad, you know, were told by a pulmonologist to put me into the swimming pool to help cure my asthma. And after about you know, three weeks or three months, I don't know which it was, probably three weeks, I decided that I didn't want to be involved in swimming anymore, that I enjoyed being out and about, being in a team setting and a team environment. And, you know, I saw myself as having my time better spent being involved with that. And I continued doing that until I was probably 15, 16 years of age and had a bit of a fallout with our cricket coach and understood that I probably you know, wouldn't reach my lofty aspiration as a cricketer. And my swim coach at the time, Gavin Ross, said to me, hey, I, I don't know how good you could be. I believe that you could get a scholarship and go and swim in the United States, and that's my goal for you. And I think you should commit to swimming full time. You know, there was never really external pressure. And I find a lot of a lot of youngsters today, it's their parents that want them to succeed more than the kids actually want to succeed. And it's quite unfortunate that they're pushing their own agenda. And you do see it quite a lot. I've been fortunate enough to work with several kids one-on-one and they just don't want to be there. And it really is the parents that force them to be in this situation. And I think the ability to be able to perform in other sports and to learn about self was critical. And I think when you're put into different situations, different competitive environments, whether you're competing in and amongst a team, it teaches you ideals and values and sportsmanship and camaraderie. And then being involved you know, in an individual sport, it teaches you how important you know, working on your own is. Solo efforts that you know, the time and the effort that you do put in, it does equate to success or failure. So do you think, let's say you were growing up today and you did exactly what you did you didn't really start sort of getting into it until a later age 
do you think you would have become a professional athlete? Do you think it's changed a bit or do you think children can still diversify and then become an absolute elite athlete in a particular field later in life? I believe you can diversify later. I mean, the biggest thing or the hoopla now in, in all of the drafts is, oh, well, this two-sport athlete or this three-sport athlete. And you know, people are making such a big deal about oh, while well, they competed in multiple sports, but that's been the reality for years and years and years. You find some of the best athletes in the world, the best cricketers in the world. A.B. de Villiers was a, not many Americans follow cricket, but A.B. de Villiers was a multi-sport South African representative for years and years and years. So it's not uncommon. In general, I think it's more uncommon now when we look at, at the world of elite sports, when people have been you know, really specializing since the age of five or six. And I still think the way that I did it would work and be of a benefit to me now. I don't believe in the 10,000 hour rule. I think there's so many people that I know that haven't spent 10,000 hours being or spending that time in their craft or becoming a professional and they still you know, ended up being world champions or olympians could 10,000 hours potentially be the level or the energy system work that you've done whether it be sports specific or in other sports i don't know but personally i don't believe in the 10,000 hour rule and i'd like to still believe that you know i would grow up with a support to be able to play multiple sports and have a greater identification of self or a greater understanding of self and in and of itself chosen my own route. That's the key thing is when, when something is put in front of you and you're forced to do something, that's when you see a lot of people burning out. Most people, are, you know, by the time they're 18, 19, 20, 21 in college, they've swum three or four years, they're sick of swimming because it's not something that they wanted. They like the idea of a scholarship but it was something that was forced on them from the time that they were a kid. Whereas in my situation, I always kept on choosing swimming. It was something that I loved to enjoy. It was something that I was passionate about. And then all of a sudden, when the values and the ideals become being a professional and all of the motivation becomes extrinsic of you know, breaking world records, impressing people, showing off, winning money, et cetera, et cetera, that you sort of lose your own value or your sense of value and it definitely makes things significantly tougher. Yeah, that's interesting. So it sounds like to me it was your passion and the fact that you chose the sport rather than being told to do it that really kept you going. Would that be right? Absolutely, 100%. I think some of the best athletes in the world are those that continue to do the sports that they excel in because of the sheer love. You find you know, a guy like Tiger Woods right now you know, Tiger Woods has struggled for years with his back, and while he may not be winning right now with the frequency that we're so accustomed to, he's got a joy back because he understands how complicated this game is. He understands how the body has to be healthy to be able to perform and participate. It's when these professionals and these real champions you know, experience great devastation and failure and possibly losing their career for the rest of their lives that they all of a sudden gain their respect back you look at a guy like michael phelps who retired michael retired because he achieved everything there was and all of a sudden understood that man swimming has been a part of my life and something that i actually love and appreciate it's something that i'm good at it's something that i can use as a means to show the world you know how good a person can be if you believe in yourself if you train hard and you know, he comes around and goes to Rio and does as well as he does. And then now as a father with two kids, it's this man has his love and joy for what he did and does. So if it's not 10,000 hours, what are the secret ingredients? <laughs> when I hear somebody ask for a secret ingredient, my impression of that is always somebody's looking for the shortcuts. And there are well, no I, de shortcuts. I definitely don't think there's a shortcut to being an elite athlete. So tell me the long cuts. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't imagine for a second that you believe or even would be asking for specific shortcuts. I think 10,000 hours is an arbitrary number. I don't think that you will obviously have the outliers that can swim for a year and end up being an Olympic champion. A guy like Anthony Irvin, he's just an amazing natural talent, just so gifted in the water. And for those that don't know who Anthony Irvin is, is he won the Olympic gold medal in 2000. Just a youngster, super, super skinny, not a ton of power. If you looked at him, you wouldn't ever think he'd be an Olympic champion in the 50-meter freestyle. 
and he retired in 2001, I believe it was, and then comes back, does a return, and wins another Olympic gold in the same 50-meter freestyle in 2016. So 16 years apart. Here was a guy that took so much time off and still comes back and wins an Olympic gold medal. I believe that hard work, desire, movement, expression, all of those trump the 10,000 hour rules. There's definitely no one specific thing. It's, you know, each athlete in and of itself is different. For me, it was, you know, being pedantic, being so methodical about what I was doing, being so focused on every single movement that I was making in the swimming pool. There was never a time where I would, you know, do a set or a stroke that there wasn't specific purpose behind. That worked for me. It was also to my detriment at a later stage in, in my career. For somebody like Anthony, Anthony just gets in and does what Anthony needs to do. And then he gets out and he goes and games and plays his guitar and just chills out. And that worked so well for Anthony Irvin. So it's to each person their own. It really is different. But you find that the common themes amongst the champions are very similar. Interesting. So you mentioned it was a detriment to yourself. What actually happened? Because I was somebody that was always researching, always trying to find ways to get better. I started looking into my competitors and you know, I started looking for the similarities and the commonalities of the world's best sprinters to see what they were all doing effectively. And it was sort of you know, preempted by a, an Australian coach that came and spoke to me. And Australian coaches were always technique savvy. And while I believe that my coaches at Arizona at the time weren't specifically technique conscious the way other nations or other coaches may have been, and I sort of had that seed planted in my head that my stroke technique needed improvement. And instead of relying on something that I had naturally gotten me to three Olympic medals and several world records, I started trying to change things. I started trying to implement what made others good instead of you know, what really made me good. So being as cerebral as I was and so focused on everything I do, I started making the changes in my stroke technique and the things that I was doing and you know, started really focusing on things that I call the uncontrollables, being other people's performances and other people's stroke techniques. And it was sort of that that led me into this deep, dark pit that I couldn't find a way to get out of. And sometimes the technique worked and sometimes the techniques didn't work and I think that led to even more frustration, just not knowing, you know, what specific technique to revert back to. Do I, and at points, I tried to just go back to my old technique and it didn't quite work the way I'd hoped. It was tough. And I look back at him and I think, man, I was such a fool to be doing everything that I was doing and to, you know, there were so many benefits to being so cerebral, but there were so many costs to it as well. And I wish I'd had you know, a guide or, you know, a real mentor that could have sat me down and worked with me to figure a way out of it. But it's given me a whole different appreciation for it at this point in time. And, you know, when I do see people struggling, it's like, okay, well, what is the person's movement capacity? What is the person's joint capacity? And that's something that I didn't understand as a younger swimmer. We have these ideologies and these dogma in swimming that the stroke technique has to be a certain way. But we don't understand what people's physical limitations are. And, you know, my shoulders were tight. I had tight hips. So as much as I was being asked to get into a specific position, I just wasn't able to. And I never understood why. And, you know, having the opportunity to work with guys at Altus and a guy called Dan Paff in Phoenix, just understanding that your joint capacity and joint expression or movement expression often trumps everything else. So it really has been an interesting last couple of years for me looking into the world of swimming and the world of sport in general and how that pertains to what I'm doing and, and want to be doing. Wow. So basically you researched for the best way and as a result potentially became a worse swimmer? Without a doubt. It really was a struggle at points. In sprint freestyle, like I said, there are a certain amount of commonalities amongst the best swimmers in the world, but there are also a huge amount of differences and I think what my problem was is I always looked at, okay, well, what is the best person doing right now? It's like, okay, well, these are the commonalities across the best swimmers or best sprinters in the world. But, okay, this is the best person in the world right now. What is he doing? And then I would try and implement or try and mimic some of the major components of what they were doing and ultimately negating 
what my strengths were. I looked at somebody's stroke technique and at that point in time, I didn't have the understanding of what their joint capacity was, what their movement capacity was. I was putting myself in the very exact same mold, but what I was seeing was a snapshot. I didn't have a deeper understanding of what their body was capable of doing. And I think that's a problem with a lot of coaches in swimming and in sports in general. It's like, oh, well, this person's the best in the world. We should copy everything that they're doing. Well, we Mm. don't really understand what they are doing. This technique might be what has made them the best in the world, but we don't understand everything that goes into it. We don't understand if there are any viruses or mechanical failures within the body that have caused them to just naturally adopt that. So it was detrimental to me at that point in time. I don't think my coaches or I understood things to the level that we do now, which is great. It's great that there's an evolution in the process. It's great that there's an evolution in the train of thought taking place, which is awfully encouraging and exciting just to know that that I am growing in some sort of capacity. Mm. And during this process, I assume this is perhaps why you missed the qualification for the fifth Olympics? Right. That was definitely one of them. I'd been struggling with finding a technique that I felt was working that took the opportunity. I moved to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and people are probably thinking, why there? But there's a South African coach that coaches at the University of Alabama, and I believe that you know, going out and working with him there, I'd be giving myself the best opportunity to qualify for a fifth Olympic Games. And unfortunately, it didn't work out the way I'd expected. It's really hard as an older swimmer. I was 35 at the time. And, you know, a lot of coaches in the world don't really know what it takes to coach an older athlete, especially not in the world of swimming. I think we are dogmatic about the training methodologies and the idea of, you know, we obtain speed through endurance as opposed to speed as the basis for speed. And and a lot of what we had done in the swimming pool, looking back at it now, wasn't good at all. It was really detrimental. And, you know, the, the amount of just overtraining that I had been doing and I was just totally broken down something like you know a max power clean my max power clean was 225 230 at that point in time and going into my olympic trials i was struggling to lift 185 pounds off the floor so there was severe neural fatigue severe muscular fatigue in there and by the time we my coach and i had picked up on it it was just too late so there was just not enough rest that could go into allowing me to qualify. And I just knew that before the trials as well. I just knew it doing a fast swim a couple of days out of the meet, just feeling slow and not feeling powerful, dying at the end of the practice swim and thinking, I don't know if this is going to happen, which was, you know, sorry, go for it. Yeah, no, so I was just going to say, so you mentioned overtraining. Do you think if you had been younger, then that sort of protocol would have worked for you? What did it look like? What did a week in the life of look like before leading up to the games? I look at the way we trained at the University of Arizona when I was there younger. We were doing nine swim sessions a week, anywhere from you know 4,000 to you know sometimes 6,000 meters a session. We had gym training three days a week. We were doing running you know, three days a week. Mondays would always typically be a long run. It would be anywhere from three to five miles long. Our Wednesdays would be interval runs, and our Fridays would always be stadiums. And our recovery protocols back then were not what they are now in terms of ice bars, Normatec boots, foam rolling, using skins or some sort of compression wear, using the hyper ice, those pneumatic tools. None of that was really out when I was in college, so we just relied on eating and sleeping properly. And I think you know the difference as when I was working in Alabama was we still had three to four gym sessions a week, but we were training seven or eight swim sessions a week. And sometimes I'd get a couple of swim sessions off, but I think the level of intensity was notably different from this sort of programming as what I was used to at Arizona. At Arizona, there was the premise and the philosophy that speed was obtained through endurance. So the major bulk of our work was always done at aerobic capacity and aerobic threshold and not a ton of work was performed at speed whereas at alabama there was still an endurance component but the majority of the work that we were doing was all anaerobic based anaerobic capacity anaerobic threshold and i'm not sure that there was ever enough recovery built into that for me specifically seeing the way the university kids there excelled on the programming we knew the programming worked but like i said not a lot of coaches at this point in time understand how to you know, properly prepare an older athlete just because 
it's never really been done. The athletes have always been, you know, between the ages of 18 and 26 traditionally. We don't have too many world champions or Olympic champions that are in their 30s, aside from Anthony Irvin or even Dara Torres. Mm, it's a very interesting point that you make here about age. And I think a lot of athletes and, you know, even semi-pros look back and go, oh, I could do this when I was 20, so I can surely do it now and, <laughs> and really push themselves. Did you um, find that when you were training for the Olympics, Obviously, it was very intense on your body. And did you find that the recovery in terms of, I guess, all this technology plus the nutrition and the sleep were a big component and was really focused on by the coach or not so much? Not so much. I think there might be this misunderstanding in the world of sport. When you look at Olympic swimmers, and think, okay, well, they're Olympic swimmers and they've won medals, so they must be rich. They must have a ton of money. And it's not really the case. You look at most track and field Olympians, you look at most swimming Olympians, they're scraping to get by. So, you know, unless you're part of a professional team or, or a real university outfit that has the recovery tools, whether it's the Normatex or the Hypervibe or Hyperisis, it's, you know, you're kind of relying on your own knowledge and your own sort of ability to use recovery tools. So that might just be something as simple as foam rolling or finding a massage or trying to eat right so while the coaches are all for it it really is limited in the amount of recovery tools that we ever had in arizona we just didn't know any different you know the head coach at points in time would say oh well you know just have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and that'll be great at that point in time we just didn't know any better and i think over the last 15 20 years as science has you know taken a greater look into recovery and its significance and importance and and seeing the different methodologies that can be incorporated into recovery, that's more teams and more individuals are actually making use of it. So a young athlete now at Arizona, would they experience a different, I guess, lifestyle in terms of you know nutrition and recovery? And would there be a protocol to follow or would it just be up to themselves? It's my understanding that there is more of an emphasis placed on recovery. I know that universities now have dietitians. They have psychologists that are working one-on-one -on -one with the athletes to try and structure and implement recovery strategies that will help them perform better. Whether or not it's something that's really focused on and sort of, I won't say enforced because I don't think anybody wants to have something enforced on them in a college environment. I do believe it's better. They are more educated. People understand the significance and the importance of recovery now. As Whereas, I mean, I look at the 2004 Olympic Games we had no compression garments. We didn't have any of those Normatec boots. After we won the Olympic gold in that relay, I went and I swam down. I, I just did my loosen up in the swimming pool. And after that, I just had a quick massage, went back to the village, had something to eat, and then went to bed. But there's also something to be said about that. I think we can get so focused and just overly focused on all these different tools that we have at our disposal. It's like, okay, well, looking for that quick secret or looking for that quick way of going about things. It's like, okay, well, there is something to be said about just eating right and sleeping well. But if we rely too much on technology, we can also end up you know, going the wrong way and having it hurt our performances. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned sleep and nutrition as being far more important than all these other little sort of quick hacks that you might call them. So what did your sleep and nutrition look like, say, back then? And has it changed over time? I think it's interesting that you mentioned, I've seen so many people, so many professional swimmers and athletes, and they're like, oh man, I bought these Normatec boots for thousands of dollars, and I bought this Hyper Ice, and I've, I've got a foam roller, and you know, I'm doing all these things to recover, but I'm just not recovering. It's like, okay, well, what do you eat like? oh, you know, I, I like pizza and I'll have beer and I'll probably sleep four or five hours a night. <laughs> okay, well, you'd be far better off spending that money and eating well and sleeping better, invest in a better bed or better pillows or cool your room down. I mean, what is your sleep hygiene? Focus on that. For me, it was always, I loved cooking. You know, it was something when I got to America, I'd, I'd grown up in South Africa and all our meals were home cooked. So when I got to the States, it was something, okay, well, I don't want to eat junk food. I sure there's a place and a time where you can go out with friends and you know have a burger or some junk food or nachos, whatever it is. I've never been the person that bores anything like that and says you should never ever have junk food or you should never have beer or 
you should never be drunk. It's like, okay, well, there's a time and a place for all of that. And does getting drunk and eating garbage make a part of my season when I'm wanting to perform? No, definitely not. So I was always cognizant and aware of, of my sleep hygiene. As for my diet, you know, I was always really looking at different ways. I tried out the Atkins diet, the paleo diet, the low carb, high fat diets. And you know, before knowing any of that, I, my focus really was, okay, well, am I getting good high quality forms of protein? Yes. Am I eating you know, a good form of starch, like a sweet potato or a yam or some wild rice is yes okay am i eating a lot of veggies whether they are steamed or am i eating salads yes well then i'm getting pretty much everything i need am i drinking enough water yes okay am i taking in any additional electrolytes i might be losing yes but that was always more important than a specific diet plan i think now i've gotten to the point in my life where i know exactly how much i need to eat and of what sort of variety i need to eat Sleep was always something that I was really, really good at. Never used to struggle. I think probably because of the bulk of training that we were putting in. So as fatigued as I was, I'd be able to come home and after Saturday morning workout, and I'd probably spend you know a good two, three hours just napping on the couch. And never had a problem sleeping at night. It's only now, as I've gotten a little bit older, that sleep is a little harder for me to come by. And I've been using a Whoop strap for the last you know five, six months, and it's great to be able. To to see the sleep patterns and and to understand my sleep and my activity better. Mm, it sounds like you're just not smashing your body enough to uh, make yourself sleep, which isn't a bad thing. I, I think, <laughs> Absolutely, you know, I think it was a there was definitely a need after the 2016 Olympic trials. I raced until the end of 2016, and it was after that I took a lengthy break of the swimming, and I think my body just finally recovered. And like you say, instead of being totally smashed and and being absolutely exhausted at every single turn, my body started you know, understanding what recovery is and my body started healing itself. And maybe I'm just not used to the fact that I don't need nine odd hours of sleep anymore. Interesting. So you mentioned that after the 2016 qualification, you took some time off. How much time did you take off and what did it look like in terms of like your training? Did you actually do no training or did you just sort of cut it back? And also, how did life come about? What uh, things did you discover in this time? After the 2016 Olympic trials, we have our Olympic trials in April. And when I missed out on it, my good friend, somebody I've swam with for years, a guy called George Baval from Trinidad and Tobago reached out and we're the same age and we've had a similar trajectory and you know, similar experiences of coaches not understanding you know, how to prepare an athlete and he saw my struggles and he reached out to me and said, Roland, would you be willing to you know, work with me and give me some advice? And he qualified for the Olympic Games, but he wanted to perform well. And, and we worked together a little bit one-on-one. -on -one, and eventually he asked me if I would go to the Rio Olympics with him as his coach. And I felt so incredibly blessed to be able to go to the Olympics and work with him and see swimming from a different perspective. Like, you know, I'd always gone to the Olympics as a competitor and I was always a staunch competitor and never really had an opportunity to enjoy the Olympic experience. I was always too focused on what was going on and almost hyper focused, but almost too focused on on the preparation and, and the competing that I didn't really have the opportunity to enjoy just being there as a competitor and and understanding that you know in the previous four olympics that i deserved my place there that i'd earned it and it was really tough for me to you know not to be there as a swimmer but it was eye-opening for me to finally be there and be able to enjoy every component of being an olympian and something that i'm glad i experienced as hard as it was not being there as a swimmer i finally understood what it meant to be an olympian you were here in the village with you know, several thousand of the world's best athletes, that it really is a celebration of ability. And I knew that I didn't want my Olympic trials to be sort of my last hoorah, that I wanted to carry on swimming until the end of the year. We have a series towards the end of the year that's called the World Cup Series, or it's just a Grand Prix series, and, you know, elected to compete in those and, and did better. Obviously, there was a limited amount of training that I was doing while I was at the Olympics, but at other points throughout, I continued to be diligent in my training and swam the World Cups and was all right. It was better than 
the swimming that I'd done at my Olympic trials and also had an opportunity to work with a different coach, somebody that I felt more comfortable with that period of time. And, and it worked out, but the break I've taken was a good one. I stumbled upon gymnastic bodies and that's actually how you and I met. There was something that I needed because early on I spoke about joint capacity and, and movement capacity. I feel like having been a swimmer for so many years and just being so you know, myopic in my views of what training looks like that I'd negated my body in so many ways. So I've literally spent the last year out of the weight room. I haven't lifted weights anymore. I have still swum because I just love being in the water. It really is a place that I enjoy being in. But it's been a year, just over a year, of focusing solely on gymnastic bodies and, and helping get my body to a level where I'm in, no longer in any pain, where I don't wake up in the morning and feel like I can't walk. So I'm finally putting my body ahead of my desires and you know, it just makes being in the water so much easier, just so much more enjoyable because I'm more flexible. I'm more mobile. Movement is easier. My movement expression is significantly better than it's ever been, which is really, really exciting for me. Yeah, it was very inspirational. And it made me very intrigued when you told me here you were an Olympic swimmer and you couldn't even touch your knees without sort of being in pain in terms of your flexibility levels and, and mobility. And you've just come so far in, in a year's worth of gymnastics training. Would you say that you'd actually be a faster swimmer now after doing the gymnastics training? Well, sort of the goal is, and not many people know, but the goal is that I actually want to swim the Olympics in 2020 in Tokyo. So I reached out to Dara Torres, and Dara Torres won an Olympic silver at, at 41 years of age, and we've spoken about it and the feasibility. and. You know, having spoken with Coach Summer from Gymnastics Bodies, you know, we believe that putting you know, all these steps into place and really working on improving capacity will help me. And I you know, had an amazing workout yesterday. I've been working with a coach that I've you know, wanted to work with for the last five, six years, somebody that I feel really knows what it takes to prepare older athletes and had one of the best sets I've ever had yesterday. And doesn't feel good when it's happening because – I mean, swimming doesn't tickle when you're hurting, but <laughs> I just feel like I can be in position significantly easier. It's less of a strain on my body. I feel like my movement is freer. And I think that is a misperception. You're 100% right, where everybody looks at these Olympic athletes. And while there are some, like a Michael Phelps, that may have a lot more mobility, most of the Olympians out there cannot touch their toes. Most of them have sort of aches and pains. And mine was directly associated with my hip mobility. My hip, hamstring, quad mobility, I could always touch my toes, but my flexibility and mobility in my quads and my hips was awful. I couldn't go down into a deep squat and how they say ass to the grass, and that directly affected the way my back felt. And I had seen a surgeon, and he told me there was something wrong. I have degeneration in my discs, and you know I may end up having to have surgery in my back. And I was like, there's no way. I'm not going to have back surgery. And it was just so blessed and fortunate that I stumbled across gymnastic bodies and, and coached summer and undertook it religiously. And, and now I wake up in the morning with <laughs> without back pain. It's like, who would have thought? You know, I think surgeons are so willing and eager to cut into you. And it could seem like an easy fix at that point in time. But I've never been about doing things the easy way. I want to do things the right way. And if it's a question of my back is sore because I have dysfunction in other parts of my body, well, then lo and behold, I'm going to do whatever it takes. It wasn't a quick fix. It wasn't a one-week, two-week thing. But I did start seeing improvements within the first couple of weeks. And after three, four, five, six months, there was a notable difference. And now over a year into it, the differences are scary from where I was compared to where I am now. Mm, that's awesome. So you basically took a step back to have this physical transformation. Do you feel like also that you've had other sorts of transformations outside of swimming since you've taken, I guess, a step back from competing? Without a doubt. I think in the world we live in, we see progression as being linear. For lack of a better word, we're always climbing up those stairs. When people have to take a step back, we see that as a negative. While at that point in time, it may seem like a negative, eventually, we can rephrase it and look at it as something that's positive. In this situation, for me, my back was really messed up. And you know, while 
at the time I viewed stepping out of the weight room completely as a negative, as something like, well, I'm going to lose my strength. I'm going to lose my power, might lose my speed. And then all of a sudden being taken in a completely different route is like, okay, well, this is something that I've neglected for years and something that I have to do. At that point in time, it looked like a step back, but now just over a year on, that was just a detour. That was just a detour on where I was going. And, and success and transformation isn't linear. It's chaotic. And that's something we need to understand and something that's been hard for me to embrace. But you know, at this point in my life, it's something that I am learning and something that I'm adapting to that is not going to be linear. It is going to be chaotic. How do I respond to the situations I'm put in? Do I look at it as an opportunity and a challenge? Do I explore it with a playful demeanor? Or do I look at this as career ending or something that's definitely not the way I want to move forward? It's been presented. So I've always been a believer that you know the way we respond to things determines whether we're a champion or not. So there has been a lot of forced growth. I think as you know, having been a swimmer for so long, there's when you reach the pinnacle of a career, whether it's in sports or whether you're a professional and and involved in business, and all of a sudden there's this opportunity or not even an opportunity, there's this change that's being thrust in your face of moving from a first career into a second career. It's daunting. And I feel that most professional athletes aren't equipped to deal with that change of what's next. And I know for me, it was very much the same. It, it was very, very daunting in 2016, moving away from swimming into, well, what's next? My identity has been so locked up in being a professional athlete and a swimmer that is this all I am? Is this all I have to offer? It's not real. Being a swimmer is real, but that sort of belief in is this all I have to offer? While real at the time, it's not something that that I've come to understand is in fact real. So it's taken time. Right now, I'm really enjoying being back in the water and, and giving back. I've been working with several national federations in, in the world of swimming, helping consult with them on sprint performances and change and motivational components and, and really been enjoying that right now. I don't know what my third career is going to be uh, after swimming and after this, but it's something I'm eager to experience. I think I've learned over the last year that we get so fearful of hypothetical situations that we create in our head of things that haven't even happened yet. We look at something and, and just fear it instead of you know, accepting, okay, well, this may be great. It may not. If it's not great, well, I'll figure out a way to get around it. If it's amazing, well, let me just embrace it and not to be fearful of the situations that are presented to me. It's interesting, and I, I do wonder too, I mean, you've obviously seen that there's so much more than just swimming. You were sort of like, I guess, in a bubble, and maybe you had to be, and now you've looked outside and seen what else is available to you. And I wonder, because you've grown so much on so many levels in the last couple of years, do you think that there's a chance you could have even lost the drive that it takes to win? <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. I have uh, always been ultra competitive. I think while my motivations over the last year or two have changed, that innate competitive drive and desire will never change. I think I really am an alpha personality. And when I undertake something, I want to be the best at it. And that's sort of been the greatest sort of realization is that in the world of competitive sports, you can be the best at something. You can be number one in the world. But in the world of business, what does that really mean? There isn't a gold medal that's handed out to the top computer developer. There is not a gold medal or there is not a world's best in the field of asset management. There may be top quality brands or top people you can go to, but it's really only in the world of sport where you have to be the best in the world. So Ultimately, my competitive desire is always going to be there. I don't feel like that's ever going to wane in whatever I choose to do, whether it's swimming now or beyond swimming in some sort of professional capacity as a later stage. I think that drive and determination will always be a key point for me and, and something that I'm happy about. I always want to get the best out of myself, and I always want to help other people around me bring out the best version of themselves. So definitely not. <laughs> Excellent. I knew you'd say that, and I knew the answer, but I had to sort of check. <laughs> So what does the near and, I guess, future future look like for you? Do you have any sort of aspirations? I mean, you mentioned the 2020 Games. Yes. 
I'm going to continue working with national teams. There are a couple national teams I'm just trying to finalize with and for the summer here in the States. And literally, you know, I go there from three days to two weeks and I work with them. My starting technique was something that I pioneered and spent 20 years developing and trying to understand the movements, breaking down the movements. And a lot of swim coaches and a lot of swimmers out there believe that the swimming start is one of the hardest movements or one of the hardest things to get nailed down and for me it's a different belief i believe that there are several essential components and if you have those and know how to work them into your start that your start's going to be significantly better and that's just been because i've spent the last 20 years researching the movements my own movements comparing my movements to other people and you know seeing people try to evolve the start from something that i pioneered and trying to internalize and I think that's ultimately the understanding is I have that kind of aesthetic awareness of what the start needs to feel like, what it needs to look like. And most coaches have never done the start and don't know how to present it or don't know how to teach it. I've been very fortunate that I've been able to work with several national teams already and will continue to do so this year. But right now, it's busy speaking to several people in South Africa and here in the States and trying to raise some funding to assist in the preparation for the 2020 Olympics. There may be an opportunity to go and work with this coach one-on-one in Florida. That should be you know, hopefully finalized within the next week or two. So maybe moving from hot, sunny Arizona to hot, sunny Florida. So tough, that's going to be finalized life. in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I know. It's a so question. you mentioned something interesting about raising funds, and you earlier also said that you know there's this sort of myth that a lot of people think that these top-level athletes are quite affluent. And so I guess, how do you go about raising funds? And also, I heard that, and this may not be true, that you did turn down a $5.9 million contract to swim for, was it Qatar? Yeah, it was Qatar. It was, you know, after 2004 Olympics, we broke a world record. I I won the three Olympic medals. And then at World Championships in 2005, it was in Montreal. I I won gold in the 50-meter freestyle, just missed the world record, and then won the gold in the 50 meter butterfly broke the world record twice and became the first man to swim under 23 seconds and in the 50 butterfly and finished with a second in the 100 freestyle and got back to arizona and my manager at the time called me and said hey do you know anything about qatar and i was like no i've got no idea well they've got this offer in place and you know they're really trying to build swimming and the culture of swimming and the culture of high performance in their country and they believe you'd be a figure that would be able to help do that. And I must admit, it was a decision that didn't come easily. I called several you know, professional South African sportsmen, one of the top PGA golfers at the time from South Africa. I called him and he said to me, take the money and run. Mm-hmm. It was really tough to wrestle because it was, I think at that point in time, I didn't have the right advisors or the right you know, mentors around me to help me distinguish between a moral decision and a business decision. I equated that at that time as really a moral decision as to the country that I swim for. Well, I've represented my country and I've done it well and there's a certain amount of notoriety and maybe there was a certain amount of ego that was based in my decision as well, wondering if I would receive the same sort of notoriety and and respect. And like I said, the decision was invariably an emotional one that I made and and decided at the end of the day, I knew that I would never really receive that same amount of money staying with South Africa. But my hope and my belief was the South African government, the South African Swim Federation, corporates in South Africa would identify with the fact I have been so patriotic and not chosen money over the country and that I would have obtained sponsors and support that way. And unfortunately, you know, that just wasn't the case. Well, I got a lot of pats on the back about making that decision at that point in time. It may not necessarily have been the best financial decision to make, but it's something that I can't go back and change and has afforded me you know, different opportunities, different learning experiences. Um, I could go back and regret it and really you know, hate myself for making this decision. Okay, well, maybe I'm not a, a multimillionaire like I could have been, but what would have my life have been if I had made that decision versus what is it right now? So in terms of raising funding, the South African Olympic Committee and the South African government does not have a history of supporting the athletes well. So the funding that the athletes do try and undertake is largely sponsorship-based. There are a couple of top South Africans that have some really good sponsors, but 
it's just like anywhere else in the world. If you're a Usain Bolt or a Michael Phelps, you're making a lot of money because you have sponsors, you have appearance fees. But if you are, you know, the third, fourth, fifth place finisher in the Olympics, you know, you've still made the final. You're still one of the best in the world. But if you're in those positions, it really is a lot harder to come by financing and well, not necessarily financing, but funding. So how would you even go about funding for your coach in Florida? I've reached out to a couple of South African businessmen that I know. I've reached out to a couple of American businessmen just to see what the opportunities are, whether there's sponsorship opportunities. And, and I've never been the kind of person that just wants to take money and, and never bring anything from my side. It's important that partnerships are established. I think you see a guy like Gary Player. And Gary Player and his relationship with Rolex has been one that's gone on for decades. You know, Gary Player is somebody that I know well and been blessed to talk to at length. And it really has allowed me to appreciate the partnerships that can be born in the world of sport. Because sport is by far the greatest unifier out there. There is no politician in this world that can unify a nation you know, the way sport can. You look at the Soccer World Cup that's going on now. It's unifying nations. People are there in Russia enjoying the games, celebrating. If they lose, that's one thing. They're not happy, but sport has this way of unifying people and talking to Gary Player and, and being able to create partnerships in something that helps unify people and helps create additional interest or, or revenue. It's a beautiful thing. So I've been trying to find companies and people that I really could walk a partnership with, whether it's ideally now for being a swimmer, but then beyond that, okay, well, is there something that we can do in South Africa? for the development of sport? Is there something that we can do in America for the development of sport, whether it's learn to swim, prevention of drowning, building swimming as a brand, building other sports, building their companies as a brand? I think there are too many athletes in this world that just take the money, they don't give back for it, and it really is unfortunate. And I think I'm blessed and know too many people that would kick my butt if, if <laughs> I ever had that, uh, that attitude. That's awesome. Roland, I really appreciate everything you've said today. And I guess I wanted to ask you, is there any advice that you would give to someone that's actually maybe thinking about becoming professional, maybe their children are thinking about becoming a professional athlete, or they're already sort of an athlete of high caliber? Is there any sort of piece of advice? And I know there's no <laughs> magic tablet. No, no shortcuts. Um, no no I, shortcuts. I, and maybe that's <laughs> the advice. There are no shortcuts. The level of advice, the amount of advice I could give, we could sit here for another two hours. I think one thing that immediately pops to mind is when I was in high school, I just returned from our national championships at the time. There was an agreement that I could hand in a paper a little bit later, and he wasn't happy with the quality of the paper, and I wasn't happy with the grade. And I questioned him. I said, sir, this isn't what we agreed upon, and could I understand why? And I'd like to understand why I got the grade that I got because, you know, if I understand why, I could write the paper better in the future. And he said to me point blank, Mr. Skuman, you will never amount to anything in your life. And the reality is in the world that we live in, you know, more often than not in our lives, there's one person or two people that tell us we can't achieve something. We could have the love and support of our entire family and friends around us, but it is often the the words of one or two people around us that we take to be fact. And at that point in time, I had the opportunity to believe him that I would never amount to anything in his life or to really say, you know, to heck with you. And it was at that point in time that I sort of developing the understanding that the only person in this world that will determine my successes and my failures is me. I will never, ever let anybody else determine my successes and failures. I was the one that was going to go out and work hard. I was going to be the one that did absolutely everything in my power, day in and day out, to be the best version of myself. And that idea developed and evolved, and becoming the best version of myself continued to change. But I never relied on somebody else's opinion to determine whether I was going to be the best version of myself or not. And I think that's the biggest thing for kids out there is to understand that there will be people in your life that tell you you cannot achieve something. But if you want to go to the moon, if you want to be the first person to land on Pluto, if you want to be the first person to swim around the entire world six times, don't let anybody else determine whether or not you can do that. 
It's not up to anybody else. If you have a belief in yourself and your ability and you are willing to do everything in your power to achieve that goal, then do it. And if you don't achieve it the first time, what are the lessons you're going to take away from this? Always ask yourself, it's winning versus learning. I didn't win this time. What can I learn from this mistake? What can I learn from this perceived failure that will help me be the best version of myself next time? If a lot of us can view it that way, it goes a long way. Yeah, I love what you just said there too. It's winning versus learning, not losing. Absolutely. It took me a while because you know, when I finished second at the Olympics in the 100-meter freestyle, I viewed a, an Olympic silver medal as a failure because it really is at that point in time in the community I was with. If you're not winning, you're losing. Silver medal is the first place loser. <laughs> and it wasn't that. It really isn't that. And often we equate that because of the culture and the societies we live in. But it's winning versus learning. If you accept silver and if you accept that that's a failure and there's nothing you can do about it, but shame on you. And you're already winning because you're at the Olympic Games. 100% right. Exactly right. And if you take that silver medal as a motivation and a learning opportunity for the next Olympics or the next race or the next business deal, you use that as motivation and, like I say, a learning opportunity, use that to inspire you to achieve greatness beyond. Don't see it as an absolute, well, I failed, so therefore I shall never. Use this as an opportunity to become the best version of yourself. Cool. I love it. And Roland, just one little thing before I let you go. A question that we ask all our guests on the show, do you have a tattoo? I do. And I actually had two tattoos that I had removed. One was a tribal design on my right shoulder blade. The other one was some Japanese writing on my Achilles. And I've had both of those removed. And the only tattoo that I have now on my body is is the Olympic rings, and I have that on my wrist. I knew you'd have the Olympic rings somewhere. (laughs) I was so embarrassed by my first Olympics because I viewed not winning a medal as failure, and I viewed my first Olympics as a failure, and therefore did not want to remember my Olympics or signify a failed Olympics by putting Olympic rings. And it wasn't until after the 2016 Olympics that I actually had the rings tattooed because I realized that I was actually deserving of it. That's so cool. Thank you so much for coming on and can't wait to watch you uh, unfortunately beat the Aussies in 2020. (laughs) Ali, thank you so much for having me on. It really is an honor and a privilege for me. I appreciate your time. Awesome. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ali.fitness. If you liked today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe.